Let's start. I have to go back and talk more about attention. It was too easy, I thought, that how clear I was and how quickly I got through the part on attention. And then I realized that I had sort of misread a whole chunk of it. Not that I'm taking back anything, but there's a piece of it that I just didn't put in. The easy part, just to remind you where we are, was to say that the, the intellectualist uses the idea of attention in, in this double way uses attention to break down the gestalt. Remember from Merleau-Ponty always the whole determines what counts as the part, but you can, by focusing attention on the parts, make them come out of the whole and then uh, see the, say, the lines of the molar liar illusion is equal or the moon through a tube as the same size on the horizon as in the zenith. So you can use attention to take apart the whole and find elements which more or less I suspect correspond to what's on your retina and where did they come from. They're not elements that were implicit in the whole. He's very clear about that. Uh, it's the whole, the whole determines the parts but when you break down the whole there is something. Well, I presume that's where the constancy hypothesis may be right. That if you take an analytic enough attitude like a painter or an introspectionist you can actually see something that roughly corresponds to what you're getting on your sense organs. That's certainly a misleading and <coughs> wrong-headed way of using attention, unless you're a painter. But and it has a fur. It wouldn't be misleading just like that, because there's nothing wrong with breaking down your the perception and finding these elements. The the second half is the greener that makes it evil and that is that you think of attention as a searchlight that is not be, be, as he calls it being neutral not adding or taking away anything and if you th it's just like noticing when I notice something I don't do anything to what I notice at least not in a normal sort of noticing and but this kind of attention this special kind of isolating analytic attention is not neutral it's not like a searchlight. It doesn't reveal <laughs> what was already there. I've just been saying that. It produces something new, namely what these elements would look like if they didn't get their whole meaning in the Gestalt. So you break down the molar liar illusion and get two equal lines. But when in, in, in the normal perception, you see them as unequal. And it takes a lot of effort. I don't think we could do it. I think you probably have to be a painter or an introspectionist to bracket the ends of the Muller liar illusion. You know what I'm talking about. The, this, try to see, of course, I'm not going to draw it fair enough to make it count, but I mean, try to see those ends gone and the lines is equal. Maybe they are, maybe they aren't. Probably they aren't. They don't. I'm, I'm not trying to convince you. Anyway, the, uh, so, it's when you think that attention reveals what was there all along that you make the experience error, you take it that what's, uh, what you're seeing is what's there in the determinate world, or you make what's the, the sensory core error, it's the same error, just described with different motivations. Uh, you did the sensory core error, you think that what you've got when you've done this analytic kind of reflecting is what was there all along. And then, of course, you ask yourself the question, well, how does experience build up out of these elements, which are what you really see, and the experience of objects which seem to be holes with uh, determining their parts and so forth. Well, and you have an, then you give an associationist story if you're an empiricist, or you give a uh, intellectual story, which we haven't gotten to. We were just getting there. Um, if you are uh, intellectualist, but now I realize that there's another thing going on. So let me just um, start with a quote that I that I just mentioned. So uh, on 32, he's telling you that uh, you, you know all the ways that you can make a perception break down and, and, and they're all uh, and then he says I just want to remind you that Merleau-Ponty often isn't saying what he thinks 
he says on about five lines down on 32, inattentive perception contains nothing more and, not, and indeed nothing other than the attentive kind. That's, that's not his view. That's the neutral searchlight view of attention. That says that when, uh, that w that when well, and it's put in the, in the language of the uh, intellectualist. The intellectualist thinks that attentive perception, focusing on deconceptual, decontextualizing and focusing on the elements, uh, is real attention. And our ordinary way of being in the world and paying attention to things isn't real attention. That's inattentive attention. So inattentive attention is what we've got when we focus on something and bring out the details of it. We talked about that last time. You, you focus on the, some aspect and make it more of a figure and put something that was more, you were paying attention to into the background. That's re ordinary attention. That's inattentive attention from the point of view of the intellectualist who thinks attentive attention is isolating the element from the gestalt and also thinks inattentive perception contains nothing more and nothing other than the attentive kind, meaning that the everyday kind of attention, which they think of as not real attention, is only what real attention, that is analytic attention, reveals. That, the, but that's a weird sentence. I thought I would just try to make sense of it for you. It's, it's saying the same thing I said. Uh, the, but it's using, he's got so many different words in, in ways of talking about attention in his own words and in the words of the other guys. Uh, Can you do that one more time? Yeah, okay, one more time. <laughs> that there's everyday attention. That's not what he's talking about. There is, but everyday attention is called by the sensory core people, the analytic people, the intellectualists, inattentive attention. Because the everyday attention isn't paying attention to what the analytic person thinks you, you should be paying attention to with real attention. What is real attention? It's isolating what you're looking at from the context and breaking down the whole. And then this same person who thinks that everyday attention is what he calls inattentive attention. He thinks that that is really what you, seeing what you see when you pay careful attention, <coughs> which is analytic attention. And that's just the neutral spotlight idea of attention. So inattentive perception, everyday paying attention, contains nothing more and indeed nothing other than the attentive kind. That is, it's always really just what the analytic element finding attention gives you. Only, that's why they call it inattentive, inattentive. You just don't pay enough attention to notice that. If you really paid attention, you'd see what painters see when they paint, when Rouen, when, when Monet paints the cathedral at Rouen at uh, about, ten diff about five different times a day and sees it as an entirely different looking something or other with different <coughs> colors and everything. Or you see it, what, what introspectionist psychologists do. They are really paying attention. But when you are not really paying attention, it, 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 what, it, well, your experience is nonetheless what they <coughs> say it is. And they have the right to tell you that you're wrong because they're really paying attention and you are not. You, you get it yet? Uh, so, so <coughs> until you get to be able to pay attention like an introspectionist psychologist who can see just the thing and not the context, so you get so you can pay attention to the lines and not the end, you aren't really paying attention. That's why you don't see that. But that's there all along. The sensory core is really your experience of two equal lines with doodly things on the end. And uh, if you pay careful analytic attention, that's what you'd see. That's packed in that one funny sentence <laughs> as a way, way of review. And if you haven't got it, it doesn't matter. I mean, if the idea is important. You could, if you take time, you could sort of read, but you could translate that <coughs> sentence into what I've been saying if you want to. But the sentence is on, on 32. Just, uh, I just picked it out of the way to summarize and show you how weird it all is. 
inattentive, about five lines down, inattentive perception contains nothing more and indeed nothing other than the attentive kind. I hope that after all I've just said, you could, that could be a good exam question and you could answer it, you could explain what that sentence means. It's just a funny condensed way of saying the story we've been saying so far. It's on page 27. Those oh, thanks. Good. Okay. Yes, uh, it's good if somebody who has the older version says the other page number. That would be helpful. So I Sometimes I have the other page number, but I don't know if I had that one. Yeah, I did. Uh, okay. Now, so now attention is not a searchlight. It breaks down the perceptual field. It's not revealing by carefully paying attention what's been there all along. It's not neutral and so forth. Uh, that's, he's saying it again on 33. I don't know, you'll have to find it because I don't have the other page number in here. But I wanted to read the end of the paragraph. You can find it because it's right before a new paragraph that begins against this conception. So it says, perceptual consciousness is confused with the exact forms of sorrow. Sorry, this is that one. No, it just says again, there's no reason why. Attention creates nothing. But I, I guess I'm reading it because I want you to realize we're inside the... the that's not Merleau-Ponty's view, that attention creates nothing. That he's talking from within the uh, intellectualist, where perceptual consciousness is confused and so forth, it, and doesn't, uh, doesn't, get it, get it, doesn't get it right. In spite of the intentions of intellectualism, the two doctrines then that is, empiricism and idealism and, and intellectualism, have this idea in common that attention creates nothing since a world of impressions in itself or a universe of determining thought are equally independent of the action of the mind. That is, we are just finding out what's there. Okay, that's where we were last time. But now we go on and very strange things are happening. We ask, well, th these are all bad stories about attention. What is attention really? What is its positive function? And I think there are two. And last time I was talking about one of them and did it sort of, and that is it's this enriching function where you sort of zoom in on something and explore it. That's uh, on, again, I, because I, when, when, when I, sometimes I have the old page numbers but sometimes I don't, I'm now um, going to, but now I get worried. You, I'm not going to try to do it if you find it, uh, but I want to read the, where just another version of this enriching talk is in the paragraph that begins, now attention, about halfway down. The miracle of consciousness consists in its bringing to light through attention phenomena which reestablish the unity of the object. Whoa, no. I mean, that's, no in the sense I, I shouldn't be reading that yet. Uh, <laughs> Uh, wait a minute, now, now it's just in my notes. That's what I want to talk about next. But where is... Mm, interesting. I think I just wrote something wrong here. Don't worry about it. It's what I... This enriching function is the way that your attention is drawn to something because you're interested in it or looking for it and then you respond by making the unpacking the horizon and I talked about how that on page 78 is that what I'm looking for go ahead where well interesting interesting uh, I got to look at that because I decided maybe that that's one of the places where you, he's doing something different than I thought. Let me, that's why I stopped when I started reading it. Let's read it and find out. To pay attention is not merely further to elucidate pre-existing data. It's to bring out a new articulation of them by taking them as figures. They are performed only as preformed, only as horizons. They constitute a really new region of the total world. No, oddly enough, that is exactly not saying the same thing. That's why my notes confuse me. There are two different things going on. The, the positive use of perception is to bring out 
something as figure on a background. That's why this is so confusing and misleading. What I read last time on page 78 of this, which is for you right at the beginning of the chapter Experience and Objective Thought, uh, if you if you look, that's where you, I'll just read you a, to see an object is to have it on the fringe of consciousness, or to in effect turn on the horizon and open it up, uh, become anchored in it, and so forth, exploring it, and you sort of close up the background and, and where you were and make it into uh, a figure, and you plunge into it and so forth. That's, all that is well expressed in the... In, by the way, and maybe I'll go a little further than I did last time. He has, I don't think I said this. He has this great difference between this kind of uh, positive role of attention, of bringing out what is on the horizon. Uh, and when he says it doesn't happen in movies, he has this brilliant idea that, that to every once in a while compare what he's talking about to movies because movies don't have figure ground characteristics uh, the, and the film is like the retina it's just got some determinate something on it so he'll say later that when a train comes at you in a movie it looks like it gets bigger and bigger very fast because if you're, it's just the movie is just registering the size of the, of the projection on the, through the lens onto the film of the train and it's very different than our normal experience of trains. Well, here he's saying that when you, and this is really quite amazing. I'm going to read this. When in a film the camera is trained on an object and moves nearer to give a close up, we could remember that we're being shown the ashtray or the actor's hand. We can't, we do not actually identify it because the screen has no horizons. What is that? I'm now on page 78 of the book you guys all have, I hope, about 15 lines from the bottom. Okay, and that's, that's the story. If we sort of focus in on the ashtray and make it the, the, the center of our attention, this is our kind of attention, and put the previous scene, let's say, of the, of the person smoking uh, into the background. And so we understand uh, that. In our, if that happened in our experience, we'd have the ashtray on the margin and we zoom in on it uh, in the sense of bring it out of the margin into the focus. But the camera, I mean, I don't know what would happen if the camera zoomed in on it. He doesn't have zooms. It would it'd be interesting to figure that out. I don't want to do it in front of you. I, it wouldn't work what we wouldn't be doing what we're doing. Even if it zoomed in on the ashtray, you'd have to figure out that that's the ashtray which was there in the picture before, but not at all something you were noticing on the horizon. You, you wouldn't, you'd have to associate it. How does he put it? You'd have to figure out. You'd have to remember that there was an ashtray there. And now that, at, uh, at the edge of the picture, and, the, and you'd have to figure out that it's the same ashtray that you now see in the close-up. Yeah, zooming in one help. You now see in the close-up a cigarette being put out. That you could figure that out. Movies work. But that's not the way we experience it. Okay, so all that's supposed to be one kind of positive function. What I'm calling uh, enriching it or having your attention drawn to something or unpacking it as he talks about it sometimes. Now, but there's another one. There, it, there are really two functions. You, you go back to 31. He, in a quick way, gives you a hint that this is coming. 31 is way back at the beginning of the attention chapter in the second paragraph he just says in very brief about ten lines down in order to relate it to the life of consciousness one has to show how a perception awakens attention and kind of how attention develops and enriches it now that i i miss read, i mean i miss announced I mean, that doesn't tell you what i'm about to tell you but it, but i'm going to show you there's two senses in which it develops and enriches it. We just talked about the one, by focusing on the ashtray on the margin and uh, burrowing into it and taking, up your, taking it up as your whole interest. But there's another sense, totally different of en enriching it, which is now what we have to look at. And this is what I hadn't realized ever. That's why I'm spending time on it now, because I'm sort of teaching it to myself. 
it also has and I'm amazed that he brings this in because he doesn't develop it and he doesn't you know, prepare you for it it's got the positive job of opening up the conceptual world in which we see everything as determinate figures so that we see determinate objects with properties uh, that's a, another role of attention uh, a positive important role of attention such that you can pay attention to this lecture not I mean there are three ways you can pay attention to it really uh, you can pay attention to it as uh, trying to see it like an impressionist break it down into its visual elements you can pay attention to it by getting really interested in it and sort of burrowing in on it and unfolding it. Or you can observe it as an object, a stable object with a certain shape and size, with well, an object with, with qualities. And it's important to be able to do that. And it's something we do. And it's something that he has so little to say about that when he does, you don't even notice I didn't. And that's why when it did, I want to talk about this for a minute. And maybe it comes up more often in this book than I realize. Right now, I'm on page 33. Um, he's talking about... <coughs> well, I don't know yet because my notes are so confused because I'm just so getting used to this. 33... Uh, the first, the, the full paragraph, against this conception of an inactive subject, the analyst of attention by the psychologist, that's the Gestalt people, acquires the value of a self-discovery. And the criticism of the constancy hypothesis develops into a criticism of the dogmatic belief in the world seen as a reality in itself by empiricists and as the imminent end of knowledge by intellectualists. Attention, first of all, this is the crucial sentence that woke me up. Attention, first of all, presupposes a transformation of the mental field, a new way for consciousness to be present to its objects. Now, I've always thought, yeah, breaking down the gestalt. But no, this is something that is a good way. Attention is the way we have the experience of the presence of stable objects. Now, on that one sentence alone, you could never base a lecture or get very interested. But it it's, goes on for a while. Um, the middle of page 34, the next page. And what's, what he's going to tell you, I have to prepare you because it's always so obscure. Attention here stands for what I've called detached observation sometimes. There's really two kinds of detached observation. I said last time, once or two times ago, impressionist painters have it. They have it in this breakdown the whole way. But there's another kind of detached observation. I just told you, just look at the lectern. Look at the stable characteristics it's got. Don't break it down into elementary impressions, but don't get involved in it and cope with it and, and make it transparent like it is for me just something supporting papers which I don't even see just study it and that's when you get a certain form of detachment really just objectively paying attention is what he's talking about and he says it in the middle of the page the act of attention can localize or objectify this invariant factor let's say the characteristics he's got a sort of complicated brain injured case but I don't want to talk about that the, the ob objectify this invariant factor because it has stepped back notice that that's the interesting thing Ch stepped back from the changes of appearance attention therefore as a general and formal activity doesn't exist there is in each case a certain liberty to be acquired a certain mental space to make the most of it it remains to bring to light the object of attention itself there is literally a question of creation Boy, lots of strange things are happening here. You step back, you actually bring to light something about the object. But this is not like the sensory core theory carried up to the level of objects. It isn't as if you see the object as it really... It isn't... If you really understand perception, it isn't that you think you see the objects as it just is. You see that you have created a new 
way of organizing your experience in which stable objects will now appear to you. That's this creation. It's not, here's a good way to put it, it never occurred to me, that the first, the bad attention, remember when I say bad, I don't mean it's, you, it's, you shouldn't ever be an impressionist or a gestalt psychologist, but the misleading kind of impre- attention is a destruction of something. It's a destruction of a global uh, whole into its elements. This kind of attention is the creation of something. It's the creation of the everyday stable substances with properties that we normally experience and which we think are just there all along and that we are just open minds, that uh, open heads that see them. But he, he's, he wants to give you a story about how you manage to stabilize your experience into this new form in which I think you could say, and this is where the quote about figure comes in, everything is figure. You, you manage to make the qualities and the shape and everything determinate. And then, and you'll hear more about this later, you get the retro- retroactive illusion that you're just an empty head turned toward a completely determinate world. Whereas, in fact, you have to compose the text of the world. You, you, twice you compose it. Once you compose it into the figure ground uh, objects the, of uh, whose... Uh, well, let me think how to put this which you're involved with and uh, have all kinds of characteristics like attractive and repulsive and they're tending toward, and they draw you to get a better and better grip on them. The whole Merlot, what Merleau-Ponty is really interested in, our involved perception of the significance of things as we cope with them. That's one way we compose the world into significant, useful affordances to use the gifts of And now we're talking another way we compose the world, into stable objects, which we're able to contemplate and look at the determinate characteristics of and develop a science about and so forth. And oddly enough, that's what he's talking about here. I've ridden the bed on it, partly because it's a new kind of creation that you get when you step back. Notice that. I'm not reaching... I'm making a fuss about that because it isn't stepping back that gives you affordances. You've got affordances when you're about to go out the door and the floor and the floor affords support or when you're hungry and the food affords eating and you find your arm going out to the food. That's the level that Merleau-Ponty is interested in. That's the absorbed phenomena. But, lo and behold, you can, and he better say this, step back somehow and see objects that don't afford anything, that are just stable substances with properties. And that's what he's talking about, I swear. Okay. But he said step back from. Okay. The changes of appearance. Mm-hmm. Well. It doesn't sound like engaged. Good, good. Okay. I, I buy that. Like, like, a, like something which you think is only achieved through a different kind of thing. Okay. I'll buy that. I need a better place. I'll look for a better place. I think we'll find one. Because the reason that happens is because he's doing this piece in terms of the brain-injured people who can't uh, get a distance from their, the, their sensory field of experience. And so it keeps shifting whenever they shift their attention. And this gives you some way of stepping back. And I guess, let me see if I can find... It even seems like he's saying the opposite. Really? Wow. Tell me. If you go back further into the (coughs) beginning of that paragraph, he says, attention, first of all, presupposes a transformation of the mental field, a new way of consciousness to be present to its object. But then the example he gives is locating position on his own body. I know, that's what I say. It's misleading, or I think misleading, that it comes in that context. I was trying to take it out of that context. But let's go back to 33. Remember this is this business now? Uh, okay. Wait a minute, I wanted to say against this inactive subject. Oh, 
particular, you touched in your body where you engaged my faculty. Yeah, but this guy, I mean, this is, this is this brain injured person who doesn't have the normal rea relation. We've got to find a place outside of that. But I, until we do, I haven't made my point. So let me try to find the place where I can. I mean, the, 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 it sort of cuts both ways on 33. He's about uh, six lines down. He says, attention, first of all, presupposes a transformation of the mental field, a new way for consciousness to be present to its objects. Now, that's what we're trying to understand. What is this new way? And now let's see if on 35, the paragraph that begins, now attention, I want to say, I think this is, now I want to claim that this is this kind of attention I'm just going to talk about now that gives us stable objects. Now, attention has to be conceived on the model of the primary acts and secondary attention, which would be limited to the calling. Knowledge already gained with, once more identified with an act, which would, once more identified with acquisition. Now, let's, I don't know what that means, but I'm not going to try to stop and ask myself. To pay attention is not merely further to elucidate pre-existing data. It's to bring about a new articulation of them by taking them as figures in life. Palettes. They are trans they are performed only as preformed only as horizons. They constitute in reality new regions of the to total world. It is precisely the original structure which they introduce that brings about the identity of the object before and after the act of attention. Now, I think that's got to do with getting these qualities. But once the color quality is acquired, and only by means of it, do the previous data appear as preparations of this quality. Once and so forth. Um, now let me see, I'm still looking for what would be crucial. Skipping down, the miracle of consciousness consists in its bringing to light, through attention, phenomena which reestablish the unity of the object in a new dimension as at the very moment they destroy it. This attention is neither an association of images nor the return of the self of thought already in control of its objects, that's empiricism, that's intellectualism, but the active constitution of a new object makes explicit and articulate what was until then presented as no more than an indeterminate arising. Well, I don't know yet. <laughs> and you, you can see why I, I'll get, anyway, you can see why it's confusing. Which object is he going to be, is he talking about? He could be saying, well, aha, then I'll tell you why I think this, and then I'll let him talk. See, if you were talking about the kind of objects that you've got when you are responding to affordances, which is, is he talking about how thanks to the way the body works, we can see affordances, floors that, that we walk on and food that we eat, and it just calls to us and we respond? Or is he talking about the way we see objects when we are seeing them as substances with properties? Well, I think what, I'm, what I thought this morning, and I haven't read, I'm certainly not ready to give it up, is that attention must have to do with seeing objects as objects. You're not attending to things when your arm goes out to them to eat them, or when you walk out the door and the floor affords stepping. You wouldn't put the discovery of affordances in the chapter on attention. Affordances are exactly what show up for you when you've got your mind on, uh, you know, getting to work. The floor, the, with its affording walking, doesn't get your attention. When I'm lecturing, the, the last thing that has my attention is the lectern and its properties. But I think, and so the question I asked myself this morning was, why is he bringing in this talk under attention, since I've always thought he was only interested in affordances? Okay, yeah. I think what he wants to emphasize is that attention is like there's kind of a good sense of attention. Yeah, I'm trying to get that. Just happening all the time, more right. or less. And I think what he wants to say that you know he says here the first operation of attention is then to create for itself a field. And so it's a phenomenal field that he wants to get at, and and it's and there is this phenomenal that's field in both ah. cases. And so that's why he I think that's why he mentions this peculiar case of the of the person who's being stimulated, right? Because there you're getting the the kind of 
sensation goes out the field because the person is not stuck. Okay, good. But when you do create the field, then it, it looks happens. like it's a question of stepping back and creating something new with and figures. You think that's all the coping story? No, but, uh, but even with that, there's a field. That's the point. Right, there has to be there's a field. There's a field when you're coping, there's right. a field when you're making a scientific observation. Okay, and why would attention be necessary to create the field? Why would you call that attention? A lot of people want to talk. Let him talk. I'm sorry, I've been filled up. You wanted to say something a while back, right? Or did I imagine it? Oh, well, I was wondering if you think that, like, maybe like egos of intentionality with an S representation is not necessarily verbal, it's kind of floating around. Intentionality? Well, I, mean, I don't want to talk about that. With not no with T, but like with, with an S. No, I don't think that's floating around. No, I don't think that that's... That's, although I can see why you say that, because when um, if if we were giving our, us a, giving a description of objects somehow independent of our purposes and so forth, then maybe. But uh, no, that only makes me would make me confused. Right. This is more of a question about how you might think about this. If you think about the process by which you become capable of skillful coping. Um, let's take from applying uh, example of learning to swim. There is a point in the process of becoming uh, capable of swimming where you thematize or intend to the aspects of swimming, like how to breathe. Yeah, how that's to how you have to do it, right? Um, and it seems that, that there is some continuum there between the way you focus in on the actual kind of techniques of using the body and the posture. And then gradually over time it begins to fade into the background and reconstitute kind of the phenomenal field of the same activity. Uh, so maybe. I mean, I don't want to do it in terms of coping skill, if I can help it, because he's talking about proceeding right now. And and even proceeding you don't start, you know, with, with the rules and the Features. Now, don't, don't, let me, that doesn't make me happy either. I'm sorry. I just got to figure, I got to suffer this through on my own. Yeah. I think part of the context where we are speaking about the, the gestalt is um, after just introducing the capacities of the child that uh, learns to see colors. So that would uh, suggest more something to what Alfred was saying, that it's related to coping and to. Uh, uh, I know he go, goes into the learning to see colors. and. That, but the, I don't think the learning to see colors is the crucial thing here. I, let me let me wait, let me find my quotes, and then then you guys can come back with your quotes. I I want to. Why do I think this? Where is my list? Okay, on 34, on 35, uh, the figure quote. Uh, I want to say it creates an experience of the objective perceptual world, 36 to, if this doesn't fix it, I, I'm in bad trouble, so let me see. It's the paragraph begins, well it's right before the paragraph that begins, intellectualism sets out. So now I'm going to read this and see whether, whether it helps me or not. Gestalt reflection makes us put the world of the exact back into the cradle of consciousness and ask how the very idea of a world of exact truth is possible. This is in this attention section. And that seems to fit what I want to say. Uh, it, and look for its first appearance in consciousness. When I look quite freely and naturally, the various parts of the field interact and motivate the enormous moon on the horizon. And then, and then he goes back to the beginning part of, of the experience. But uh, but let's and consciousness must be faced with its own unreflected light and things and awakened to its own history which it has been forgetting. Such is the true part of that philosophical the true part that philosophical reflection has to play and to arrive at a true theory of attention. Now I read that to say a true theory of attention has got to explain how we get from the holistic stuff like the moon on the horizon to a world in which there is determinate exact truth. What's this idea of the world of exact truth becoming possible in here? It's, it's the, uh, he just wants to clarify how we get the prejudice of determinate being. And yes. there's something to it. That's right. But and yeah, attention it, seems to have something to do with it. You know? Yeah, I, I think the, I think the paragraph to look at is the, the beginning of the one before. Okay. Where he talks about the model of the primacy of acts. I guess that would be focused. 
Yes. Where, 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 where? Though? Now attention has to be conceived on the model of, okay. of these primary acts. Then secondary attention, which would be limited to recalling knowledge already gained, would once more identify identify it with acquisition. To pay attention is not merely further to elucidate pre-existing data. It is to bring all of new articulation. So, I mean, then you get that's, that's your quote. Mm-hmm. I just want, I just think that he wants to say that there is the attention of our coping, mm-hmm. which creates a phenomenal field. We create and a that, field. That within this field, a transformation can happen when I make a scientific observation. Okay, but not even just, and, and any, just any old observation. It doesn't have to be right. I'm, I observe this thing here right. that has these properties. It's the objective for right. that, he, right. that he wants to get at. And okay. so now he feels like, aha, now we can account for how he got the idea of the prejudice of the term he being. Uh, that's what I mean. That's right. I think I, we, we're saying the same thing. What he, wants, what he needs to explain is why we think that there's this objective world that has these de- utterly determinate properties when the perceptual world never has complete determinate properties. And he wants to attribute that to a certain kind of attention. That's what I think the kind of the result of. Right. Well, it's the result of Yes, of a certain kind of attention to see stable, determinate objects, which then we inevitably, that's another piece of the argument, make the mistake of thinking we're there all along and explain why we saw them. And then if you throw in the experience error, you try to explain perception and attention from this objective right. specific and way. You can't and can't do that. And you give up. That's, that's right. Hopeless. But at least what I'm trying to see here is, and I think it's here, is he want, he has to have a story about why we do see objects with determinate properties. And I think he's putting it in here in the attention chapter, rightly, because we do have a way of paying attention to things, which turns them into objects. And he needs that to uh, explain why people overlook the area, the level that he's really interested in. And what's the level he's really interested in is affordances, you remember. Where our normal way of perceiving is not to look at things, observe them as objects, but to cope with them and, and, and respond to their solicitations. That's, and, and well, right? But, yeah, but he doesn't talk about affordances or solicitations yet. What, you want, what he's focusing on here is this whole tension between the determinate and the indeterminate. Right. And to understand perception as a kind of exploration which creates the determination. Right. And it creates it now, we want to say, in sort of two stages. I mean, the one stage is where the child finally creates uh, colors, and the next stage is where grown-ups see objects with qualities and secondary properties, I think. Uh, Yeah. Um, I think there's also an interesting connection with the criticism of uh, intellectualism and empiricism that kind of comes a little bit earlier, where he says that um, uh, empiricism cannot see uh, that we need to know what we are looking for, otherwise we wouldn't be looking for it, and intellectualism fails to see that we need to be ignorant. Um, so the idea being that um, there is something <coughs> right that they're both sort of going after, which is these stable, determinate objects, um, but what they don't see is that, as with affordances, something needs to be constituted in a way. So I think he's sort of acknowledging, like, like you said, uh, that there is this determinate object that we need to take account of, but really it all leads back to what he's going to say is more... That's right. um, yeah, he wants, to, he wants to explain, I mean, both, let's remember, both the, impre- the empiricists with their imp- impressions, and if we ever get there, the intellectualist who also has the same view that there is some determinate something or others which we have to put together and give meaning to. And then we have to explain where they got this idea. And then he's got this twofold story. Well, they've got this idea because we have a kind of attention which makes objects uh, appear to be completely stable and determinate with fixed qualities. And then because we can do that, we assume that, again, it's the searchlight idea, that when we do that, we, the, the, we assume, well, it's been like that all along, and we're just finally seeing that all there really is, basically, is this world of determinate objects. And now he wants to say, no, that's not how it is. That's something we, quote, created, some better to say composed. It's, it's one of the ways that we can organize, that our, one of the ways that our experience organizes itself. I, by the way, th- let me say something about that. It's always to be put 
not in the terms of us, uh, you know, synthesizing it or constituting it or anything like that. He's always on the side of experience. There are two ways that our experience organizes itself. When we're involved, it organizes itself into affordances. And when we take uh, a more detached attitude and step back from our ongoing activity, it organizes itself into substances with properties, and then we all we read back, this is what you were just saying, as if that was all along there, substances with properties, and that's the experience error, and that leaves you only with two possibilities, the empiricist story or the intellectualist story, how did this stuff that were just substances with properties ever get to be perceptual objects. Don't think about that for a moment. Uh, yeah, let me go on, maybe because I want to cover more. Uh, but Al wanted to say something a minute ago. I can wait till lunch, <laughs> okay. Let me see now where we are. Um, so there's an objective world, and you know, let me just skim my own text. Let me, do, let me just yeah. say one comment. Okay. Let me just share something that Rick said. Not, okay. Not, not my full comment, just huh? one comment. I think Rick is right that the distinction that matters here is between the determinant and the indeterminate in our experience now, where the contrast between the detached and the engaged is really not in play. And the reason why that matters is so that when I, when I look, when I give my focused attention to the lectern, the fellow behind it is out of focus. I can turn my attention to him and now he's in focus. Um, when he's in focus, this becomes background. And that's the relevant context, because it is that sort of creative process of making objects. All, all along, if you ask me, what am I seeing? I don't think of myself as seeing a blurry room. I think of myself as seeing a perfectly determined room. Yeah, I mean, that's what he's going to be most interested in. But that alone wouldn't get you, what does he call it, the world, the, the completely determined world of science, but this quote I was reading on 36, the idea of a world of exact truth. You've got to go one step beyond the way you can bring the background out as figure on some background or change it and make that figure background on some other, for some other figure. You've got to be able to go beyond that. Uh, and then you can go to the point of just seeing an isolated thing, you know, and in all of its determinateness. We're, we're, I just don't want to get stuck on this. Are one last thing. That, that that explanation is in the right direction but hasn't gone far enough to explain what Mary Ponzi is trying to get at? Have I said that or you're saying? Are you suggesting that? I'm, yeah, I'm saying, I agree with Alba that the, the, the context here and with, with Rick is to explain how it is that, since, uh, that we get the illusion that there is a completely determinate world of impressions or whatever. And the, and the answer's got to be that it's us or even, uh, that's not what I want to say, it's the way experience organizes itself that if we pay attention a certain way, we get determinate objects and that that's, and then we, it looks like that must have been there all along, that's the, always the searchlight error. And, but it's all in the interest of explaining why we've got the problem that empiricists and intellectualists are trying to solve. Now I'm going to go on to the problem that intellectualists and empiricists are trying to solve. I have to go back to the drawing board and see if I can find more evidence for what I'm saying. But I haven't given it up. I just feel I have a, you have a right not to be convinced. So now let me skim where I am. Okay, we're ready for judgment, which starts on 37 in this book, and it's, in, and it, it's the paragraph that begins at the top of 37. Intellectualism, intellectualism set out, it is true to discover. 32. Did you want to explain motives first? I did, did I? Well, I, I've got motivation. I was going to skip it. Let's see if I want to do it. Uh, Hmm. Yeah, I think it's going, to it's going to come up again later a lot at the end of the chapter. Let's wait till we get there. I because I, I think we should jump to the, this, or we won't have any new material on our uh, to think about. Okay, the the judgment is going to fill in what sensation lacks to make perception of objects possible. That's in italics in the beginning, and that's. That's pretty straightforward, and that's the whole story. 
and there's all kinds of variations of it. There has to be some ver- some kind of given, some kind of in Kant language I- I given to the intuition that is some kind of passively received meaningless data and then the mind, and this is the why they're intellectualists, has to put some kind of organization on that. Not, it doesn't just organize by association, it organizes by being brought under, to talk like Kant, categories. That is, if you want to bring it more sort of down to the lectern, to see the lectern, I've got to see, and then I have a whole complicated, uh, Kant would call it an empirical concept, uh, my, my teacher C.I. Lewis called it a meaning in mind. The meaning of this thing is that if I put books on it, it will support them. If I look at the other side, it'll have another side. If I turn out the, uh, if I turn the light up a certain way, the color will change a certain way. Uh, you, you've got a whole mental construct that you put on the basic minimal meaningless experience and then you could be experience it as something or other. And it doesn't matter here whether it's an elect- electron that affords putting papers on or electron that's got certain properties. That the whole thing is to get any kind of perceptual object out of the basic stuff. Now, I wanted to sort of fill you in the how how sort of manif- manifold this is. I mean, the basic stuff could be something like sense impressions, that they need to be organized by these categories or meanings in mind. And what C.I. Lewis thought the basic stuff was, was indubitable data like seeming to see a lectern. And the seeming to see a lectern had to be filled out by, uh, it, if I do such and such, I'll seem to see the other side. And if I put pages on it, I'll see, they will seem to be supported. And he did it all in terms of seeming, because he wanted to, he was still believing that there had to be an indubitable given. And then there's Husserl. Husserl got himself into the very interesting position, very sensible and logical, that if order is going to be put in by the mind, what's it going to start with that needs to be ordered? Well, Kant had this mysterious notion of, some, of a synopsis, which was prior to a synthesis, which gave you the minimal spatio-temporal ordered something or other. But Lewis said, I mean, but Husserl doesn't have that. He gets the notion of what he calls hyletic data, which is completely unstructured matter, perceptual matter, which you have to get the right mental set, uh, concept, to, he says, noema, to bring it under. And there's lots of sort of Husserl in the background in, the cha- in this chapter, because he's the, he's the intellectualist that Merleau Ponty is most sort of trying to overthrow at this point. But it, I'll give you an example from Husserl because it sort of helps. What would it be like to have this minimal data? Well, my favorite example is think of what happens if you think as, 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 that you're about to get a glass of milk and you get instead a swallow of water. Then it isn't as if you simply switch over and say, oh, milk, I thought it was going to be water. You get this uh sort of experience in which you just don't know what is happening to you or what's in your mouth. And then you switch from the mental, from, from imposing on it the noema or the concept milk to imposing on it the concept water, and it all falls into place. But in that moment of uh was the highlighting data. And the highlighting data, there's nothing you can say about it except it sets boundary conditions. It won't accept being taken to the milk if it's water, and it won't accept to be water data, and it won't accept to be taken as water data if it's milk data. There is some boundary on what you can take things as. But any structure that you give things, that's your mind putting on the structure. That's what Husserl calls constitution. And uh, that's the intellectualist view. I want to say one more thing because I know Alba's concerned about this. If you Husserl, I mean, sorry, the book is very confusing because it uses the word constitution when it's talking about the intellectualist and then it means imposing the meaning on the matter, whatever you think the matter is. And when Merleau Ponty uses it, it means the self-organizing of experience. So it constitutes itself into uh, well, you know, a figure on the ground. And it's very misleading that you've got to always ask yourself, is this constitution being done? Well, there are two 
level task. If you if the Constitution is being done by the mind, you've certainly got an intellectual. If the Constitution is being done by the body, then you have a complicated question exactly what that amounts to. What sort of understanding does the body have that it brings to bear on the data? Because it could just be, like in C.I. Lewis, what you're bringing to bear is if I move such and such, then such and such, and if I move such and such, then such and such. That would still be intellectualist from a Merleau-Ponty point of view. You only have a right to say from a Merleau-Ponty point of view that experience constitutes itself as such and such. And it turns out that's correlative with the body, and we'll get to that. But I think it's important at this stage just to pay attention. I'm going to give you, I'm always trying to give you guidelines for not getting lost. Here's the Constitution talk guidelines. And uh, there's a whole lot of talk about Constitution at one place. Uh, Okay, on 46, which is just in the middle of nowhere, I'm afraid, for you other people. Uh, maybe I've got it in my notes in the other form. Well, I'm just going to read it. He's talking about analytic reflection breaks the world in itself. Breaks with the world in itself, 38. Since it constitutes it through the working of consciousness. But this constituting consciousness, instead of being directly apprehended, is built in such a way as to make possible the idea, and so forth and so forth. Constituting consciousness is the intellectualist's account. But here, on page 44, And this is so confusing. Here he's going to do his story in the East Constitution, uh, about 15 lines from the bottom of 44 for me. We shall have only an abstract essence of consciousness as long as we refrain from following the actual movement by which it resumes its own operations at every instant, focusing and concentrating them on an indefinable object, gradually passing from seeing to knowing and achieving the unity of its own life. We shall not reach this constitutive dimension if we replace the plenary unity of consciousness by a complete transparent subject and so forth and so forth. There he's ready. This does two jobs. He, I think it tells you that he wants to go from, that you'll get, you can go to seeing and then to knowing and that's the two things we were talking about and both of them are constitutive in his sense, self-organizing. But uh, at the bottom, he starts talking about the other kind of constitution. Uh, let's see, let me just go on. The in intellectualist process of self-discovery doesn't penetrate as far as this living nucleus of perception because it's looking for the conditions which make it possible or without which it would not exist instead of uncovering the operation which brings it into a reality whereby it's constituted. Now that's still self-organizing. Uh, let's see if I can find a constitution which is necessarily in it. Well, he talks about, uh, on the previous page, about 15 lines down, the domain of the constituted and not of the constituting mind. When he talks about constituting mind, that he's not talking about the way uh, experience achieves its own unity, organizes itself. He's talking about the way the mind imposes order. Now, let me go back to the... the so, the, so the intellectualist is talking about the way the mind imposes order, and that could be order on sense data, it could be order on seemings, it could be order on hyletic data, but whatever it is, it's some, the, it's some kind of order which exists independent of this stuff and which is imposed on the stuff and puts it together. And the mental one is the one we want to focus on because the sense in which the body might or might not do that is too complicated for us yet. Um, so now I want to see where we are. We're on, uh, well, I like, I like this passage. Remember, this is why I keep saying it's an antinomy, the intellectualist and the, and the empiricist. Right after the italics about uh, judgment is what, is what sensation lacks, 
adds to what sensational action is perception possible. He goes on a little bit later. Analysis is dominated by the empiricist notion, which, however, is accepted only as the boundary of consciousness and serves merely to throw into relief a power of coordination of which it is itself the antithesis. That is, the, the power of coordination is this mental power and the power of just association is the other. Intellectualism thrives on the refutation of empiricism. Uh, uh, analytic reflection makes its position firm by carrying to their logical conclusions the realist and empiricist thesis and validating their opposite by showing their absurdity. So that's, that's, so now we're going to get these people who are going to reduce to absurdity the idea that we can get any the, the blind intuition, as he puts it in the next paragraph, could ever get you anywhere, that you've got to have a concept, and that judgment is applying this, these concepts to the given, whatever the, the stuff is that you're supposed to be organizing. Um, and then perception becomes, as he says, this is, this is a, 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 before that big footnote, uh, Perce perception becomes an interpretation of the signs that our senses provide in accordance with body stimuli, a hypothesis that the mind evolves to explain its expression to it, impressions to itself. And judgment explains the excess of perception over the retinal impression. All of this is just the same point. Uh, And another way to put it, I'm, we're now down about 15 lines on 39. This is the, what the intellectualist does. We, the intellectualist, construct perception instead of revealing its distinctive working. We miss the we, just very uh, confusing because it's not him and us. We miss once more the basic operation which infuses meaning, sens, that significance, into the sensible and which is taken for granted by any logical mediation or any psychological causality logical mediation is intellectualist, causality is association, and psychology now doesn't mean gestalt psychology, it means behaviors. Boy, all this, you've got to, whenever you see psychology, you must be getting good at this, I hope. You could have to ask yourself, are these the people who don't understand anything, or are these the gestaltists who understand it almost completely? So, the, and now let's see. Um, So something has, is given and has to be interpreted. And the one other point I want to get across today is the way you could, you have to understand very clearly that for Merleau Ponty, we, that getting interpreted doesn't mean having some mental <coughs> beliefs or about what's going on. Getting, I mean, sorry, no, that was very wrong. Getting interpreted sounds like there's something about which you have a belief or an interpretation. Merleau-Ponty wants to say it's built into the way things look themselves. What you, uh, what pro what affordances they have, for instance. He's talking at the bottom of 39, at the beginning of the paragraph against a large cardboard box. It's uh, you, you, if you look at a large cardboard box which actually weighs as much as a small one, you will, it, will, it will look heavier. It, you will say that it feels heavier to your hand. And the intellectualism can't say that. And then he's got lots of examples of how that works. Uh, and I just wanted to give you sort of my own kind of example so you have this in mind as you read it. Uh, because the way to see that this, that intellectualism is wrong is to see that intellectualism has to presuppose something which it then interprets and then you have some kind of meaningful experience and what Merleau Monty wants to say is that it's not an interpretation things look different depending on what you are coping with them 
as. Or what, how, yeah, what, 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 let me just give you two examples. I mean, if you, the, he, he thinks, and I think it's right, that if you look at a house from the front and you think it's a house, it looks thick. And remember, I've said this several times already, that you can go in through the front door and so forth. And if you think that it's a facade, it looks flat and like you can't go in through the front door. Now, what I'm adding to that, having said that lots of times, is there's no percept, there's no impression, there's no data that stays the same and gets two different interpretations. That's the view that he's trying to refute. And, that's, and I think that's the clearest way to refute it. And he's trying with the box example. There's nothing like the, the, the blank interpretation of the box as just a box, and then you interpret it as heavy or light. No, it looks heavy or it looks light. Just, and now, I don't know if you believe this about the houses, but I'll tell you how I seem to believe it. I mean, I, I, I remember the day that I was switched out of seeing the C.I. Lewis follower who would have said, well, it's got some particular look, and, uh, that, and then you interpret it as a, 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 a facade, or you interpret it as a house, but your interpretation doesn't change how it looks. Your interpretation just changes whether you take it to be a facade or a house. Merleau Ponty wants to say, no, what you take it to be changes how it looks. And that's, in fact, you could say, once you're in sort of in a certain involved way, uh, the, the way it looks is determines what you take it to be. So that when you're on a movie set, and all of the things look flat, and you therefore take them to be facades. And when you're on the street, all the things look like houses that you could walk into. So you take them to be houses. But it's how they look. Well, I, here's what happened to me. It's sort of a crazy story. I was going down Telegraph Avenue in Berkeley when I first came to Berkeley way back in 68. And I saw what I took to be a beautiful woman in front of me. And I just walked faster to see how she looked from the other side, having such looking so nice from the back with long hair and all that. And when I and what I found was when I got around that this beautiful woman was a man with a beard and a mustache. And this was a shock. And uh, as then this was, this was totally uninteresting. I fell behind again. And now that didn't look anymore like the back of a beautiful woman. That looked like the back of a man. And there, isn't, there wasn't any determinate impression which I had interpreted in two different ways. That's, I mean, that's when I saw that Lewis was wrong and when I saw that uh, Merleau Ponty had a very important point that we had to pay more attention to. Now you can make up interesting stories which I think are important. How did the back look different? Well, I, mean, I don't remember Merleau Ponty talking about this, but I worry about this. I think it's because the, the shoulders now look important to me, maybe more than the hips and, and stuff like that. You, you can make it, you can, it's, it's what stands out as significant. So with a house, I think, if, you, if it's a facade, you'll see the sort of blank glitters on the windows. Whereas if, if you think it's a house, you'll think you see the furniture inside the windows. You'll pay attention either to the glitter or to the furniture, depending on whether you think it's a facade or a house. Uh, so it, it, it isn't magical. It, it reads, but it looks different. It isn't as if you uh, just interpreted it that way. Uh, and that's okay. Now, having said that, we want to get back to. Uh, so there isn't a given that gets interpreted. That's where we are. Uh, uh, when we're at the top of 39, it's not uh, it's, uh, perception is a hypothesis which explains the impressions because I'm just going to repeat my point once more because I think it's so important. There is no neutral impression that, goes, that is there both in the back of the man and in the back of the woman or in the facade in the house. So it can't be that we are interpreting this, uh, our mind is taking this uh, impression two different ways. It can't even be, I think, but I, again, I say this is a difficult question that I'm not ready to talk about yet, that you can't even understand what he means by the body as something that manages to take this impression in two different ways. Because he thinks that if you think there's any impression at all that gets interpreted by the mind or the body, you've already made the mistake. 
So the, he's interested in the intellectualist view. He hasn't really thought about, I think, but I think it's a great thing to try to think about. When you bring in, how you bring in the body will make a big difference in this. But I'll, I'll do that later. Let me see now. I want to do 39. We just did uh, 40. Uh, at the bottom of, the third of, of 39. So that's the cardboard box story. Okay, we've done that. And now we're going to go on to... Well, I just like this phrase at the next page. That he's, he says, we have to apprehend an imminent sense in the sensible before judge, judgment begins. That's just another way of saying it's not a, a neutral impression that gets judged one way or another by being brought under one concept or another. There's already a meaning, and that's rock bottom. You don't go, you can't get behind that. Um, now, let's see, there's another one I wanted to show you. Uh, okay, at the top of 45, I don't know how I'm going to tell you all to get to that one. Uh, oh, wow, it's another little huge paragraph. No footnotes either. I don't know, maybe you'll find it. Um, it's, it's right back where I talked about constituted, where, where I said that it's self-organizing. Right after that, right after where I read that there's uh, operations by w in, 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 which bring things into reality whereby it's constituted. What constituted now means it's the place I was reading, remember, organized by itself, not given a meaning. He's, this is the anti-intellectual, his view. In actual perception, that's his view, taken at its origin before any word is uttered, the sign offered to sense and the signification are not even theoretically separable. That is, you cannot carve out anything in common between the back of the girl and the back of the guy, between the house and the facade. You can't find the part that's got, that needs to be interpreted and the part that's the interpretation. That's, that's his basic view, and he just keeps hammering away at it. Uh, I don't know if I need to tell you anything more in just a second, but I got three minutes, so I'll try. Well, I was going to tell you some things, maybe I will, about what not to pay too much attention to. Let's try that. I'll tell you things for the last three minutes to help you with your reading. There is all the sort of criticism of Gestalt psychology talk at the end, about five pages in from the end, when intellectualism took over the naturalistic notion of sensation. This is a paragraph that begins after that long footnote on Descartes, which I said you didn't have to read. Remember I said you didn't have to read the whole Descartes thing, which goes from uh, 48 to 53. And at the top of 53, you really ought to start reading again, but not with the kind of concentration. It gets, because what he's doing, he says, conversely now that psychology discards the notion of sensation and so forth and brings it and has a criticism of the constancy hypothesis, of course, that's Gestalt psychology. Then he has a lot of criticism to give of Gestalt psychology. And uh, that's something, since you don't know Gestalt psychology, you don't, I don't think you have to worry about it. And it's got to do with whether they, whether they believe too much in causality and too much in the real world, whether they're looking for a causal basis of the Gestalt phenomenon. Uh, so you can skip clear up to the end. You think they should read that? I think it, it, it's very important to see that Merleau-Ponty is not just a Gestalt psychologist. Okay. And that, he, and that his criticism does then have, uh, well, basically they have metaphysical consequences that will come out later. Okay. Like Granted, it will come out later. Rick is right about that. But read it in a way, don't get too worried about it. We want to agree about that because you're not knowing Gestalt psychology. You can't or even test it. Well, yeah, he knows a lot about Gestalt psychology. He's got a vested interest in this. He's got stock in Gestalt psychology. Uh, and uh, I think that, that Gestalt psychologists didn't do anything wrong. That it just, we're not discussing this. Well, they're just, naturalists. 
Yeah, but so is Gibson, for instance. And then we'll oh, no, Gibson is different. Okay, well, yeah, but then, but Gibson is what the default psychologist should have been. Right, right. And, right. Low, and that's what we're looking at, saying what they should have been, but by suffering out what they got wrong. Yeah, oh, yeah, but Gibson's a naturalist anyway, though, you see this. No? Woo. Woo, we've got to talk about this. The first chapter of the book. <laughs> okay, then, never mind. Let me go back to reading you one thing at the bottom of 56, which is uh, two page, three pages from the end of uh, the, uh, the section, which you now, according to Rick, and I think he's, I will go along with him, you should read. Let me just tell you, by the way, remember that, uh, did I tell you not to read 36 to 39? Or did, no, not, not not to read it, but that it wasn't, uh, did, did I get to the list? Another another place where it's not Merleau Ponty talking, so I'll t- let me tell you that. Uh, in the middle of 36, it's where he starts with if the moon on the horizon until so forcibly brings out. That's about 20 lines there, where suddenly it switches into uh, the not his view of attention. And I wanted to say something else too. Let's see. Yeah, and all of the 37, 38, and 39, up to the bottom of 39, up to the large cardboard box, is him getting inside of and explaining the intellectualist position. So you should read it for sure, but you shouldn't think that it's his position. That's very important. And one more thing about that, and then I'm going to. Uh, on, uh, I told you that you, should, you could skip 43 to 44. The, tr- the, the not being him really begins on 42. Starting with the paragraph, it is true that at the bottom of 42 to the middle of 44, where it says negative power of reflecting, oh, that's not him. I was told by so many people that it was helpful to tell you this that I figured I'd better go on telling you this. Uh, and now, I guess. Yeah, time is up. I, I wanted to do that. I want, and, and now we're going to go on and do the phenomenal field for... Is it, are they, where are we? We're supposed to... You're supposed to read up to 59 today, and that's where I've got. And now we're going to go on and look at the, uh, the part called the phenomenal field for next time. The reading is pretty short. That's, uh, you need a short reading now. Okay.